Hey, welcome back. Here we are for chapter 3.2. We're going to be looking at ecosystem components here. Uh, once again, in this chapter, covering a lot of material, make sure you're reading, taking notes, or at least highlighting in your outline. Here we go. Ecologists. Now remember, ecology is the study of organisms in the field, not really human involvement. So ecologists are looking at five levels of matter. The biosphere, now that's the whole kid and caboodle, the whole planet with everything. Then they're going to look at ecosystems, one particular ecosystem, the deciduous forest, the rainforest, desert, etc. Within the ecosystem, they'll look at communities. Now, communities are going to be all like the type of animals that interact with each other. So in the deciduous forest, we're going to look at the deer, the rabbit, the badger, etc., and how they would interact. We'll look at populations. Now, this would be all of the deer in a forest, or the population of possums in a forest, or the population of snakes in a desert, all of the rattlesnakes, one particular species but all of the members, and then at organisms. We would look at an individual organism. What is this particular animal doing? Then we're going to look at feeding levels. So the first that was the first five levels, and then we're going to look at feeding levels, and we're looking at a specific organism. And very simply, we're going to classify them as either producers or consumers. Obviously, a producer is going to be something like a plant, something with chlorophyll that is making its own, or not its own energy, but making its own food from an energy source. Almost all of these are getting their energy from the sun. The only real other example that is not the sun are the ones on the bottom of the ocean where you're getting their energy out of the black smokers from the heat. So some things do use just geothermal energy as the energy source that they convert into food. But mostly when we talk about producers, we're talking about plants, algae, something that is converting its energy from the sun into useful food. Or consumers, you and me, or anything else, a deer, a whale, anything that has to eat a producer or another consumer in order to live. So we're going to look at those things in those terms, producers, consumers, and we'll break them down a little further. Let's look at producers. And I'm just going to focus on photosynthesis. We understand there's a very small percentage of things that get their energy from geothermal, but most of it is going to be through photosynthesis. This is the amazing part of life. This is where a living thing takes two non-living things and turns it into life. It takes water, a non-biotic or abiotic, takes carbon dioxide, abiotic, combines them and forms a sugar, abiotic, a living thing from it. So what plants do is they're going to take carbon dioxide from the air, and really, the way the formula works out is this. They're going to take six molecules of carbon dioxide, CO2. So they're going to take six CO2 molecules. They're going to take six H2O molecules, which they're going to pull up from the root source, water. It's going to go together inside of the cell. The sunlight gives it the energy necessary for it to break apart the components of CO2 into C and O and the H2O and HNO and recombine them into glucose with some leftover oxygen. So the formula is really this. They take six molecules of carbon dioxide. The plant takes six molecules of H2O, recombines it into C6H12O6 glucose, simple glucose. And that leaves six molecules of oxygen left over, which they give off as a waste product. This is the system of photosynthesis, how a plant takes abiotic things and turns it into a biotic, a sugar. The plant then uses it as its energy source and it stores it in the form of its leaves or fruit that then you and I or other consumers eat or consume taking us to consumers. 
A consumer cannot produce the nutrients they need. You and I cannot produce the nutrients we need. We have to consume them. Many things must die for Mr. Pettit to stay alive. If I only ate chickens, I don't, we tend to eat a lot of various things, but imagine if I only ate chickens, well, it'd pretty much take a chicken a day to support me if that's all I ate. A couple of pieces for breakfast, a couple of pieces for lunch, a couple of pieces for dinner, I, you know, better part of a chicken is gone. So it would take 365 chickens a year for one Mr. Pettit, for however long I live. I have to consume something in order to live. Now consumers, we're going to further break down. So broad strokes, we talk about organisms, they're either producers, produce their own food, or consumers, they have to consume it. When we talk about consumers, we can break them down even further. Primary consumers, this is something that only eats plants, otherwise known as an herbivore. Classic example would be like a cow, caterpillar, something like this. It only eats plants. Then we have carnivores or secondary consumers. A secondary consumer is something that eats another consumer. So if something eats a caterpillar, then it's a secondary consumer. So let's take something like a frog eats a caterpillar. Caterpillar is a primary consumer. The frog is a secondary consumer. A bird eats the frog and the bird becomes a tertiary consumer. We can talk about them in terms of either primary consumer, a herbivore, we can talk about them as a carnivore, a secondary, or possibly a tertiary. And we can also talk about things in terms of being an omnivore, like you and I. We tend to eat both plants and animals. Many birds are omnivores, bears are omnivores, they'll eat whatever they can. So I could function in a sense as a primary, if all I'm doing is eating, if I'm a vegetarian, I could be a primary. If I only ate chicken for my meals, then I would be a carnivore, but most of the time, most of my meals are omnivorous. I'm eating a little bit of both. Producer, consumer. Consumers can be broken down into herbivore, carnivore, omnivore, and also decomposer. A decomposer is really just a specialized consumer. It still can't produce its own food, like a mushroom. A mushroom is not getting its energy from the sun. It might look like a plant, but it's not. It's a decomposer. It is just breaking down something that's already dead. So once something dies, falls back down, the decomposers take over. So they're a specialized group of consumers in reality but then they then release the nutrients from the waste back into the environment. Most of our decomposers are in that final stage and they break everything down so it goes back into the environment. Now, regular consumers do as well in the form of waste or poop. When the cow eats it and poops, the poop puts nutrients back into the ground. You or I, we tend to go poop in the porcelain throne. However, once again, this waste is going back into the environment and it puts some of the nutrients back in. But decomposers do it directly. They just put the material right back in. They return the nutrients to the soil, into the water, or into the air for everything to reuse. Classic ones are gonna be bacteria, fungi, but also the detrivores, the detrivores. Sometimes produce detrivore, sometimes detrivore. We're talking about the things that eat dead things, like here in Florida, the vultures on the side of the road eating the armadillos, things that just specifically eat dead things, whether it's uh, vultures, uh, et cetera. Top of my head, I can't come up with another, but there are a lot of animals that are actually just detrivores. They eat other dead organisms. Producers, consumers, decomposers, which are really just a specialized consumer. They use the chemical energy that is stored in the glucose or the proteins of other things. And in most of our cells, energy gets released by 
aerobic respiration. It's an oxygen process. I eat my sugar, or I drink my Gatorade, whatever it may be, I eat an apple, and then my body uses that sugar with oxygen, because we need oxygen in a combustion event, we're burning the calories, and we're turning the glucose, the C6H12O6, back into carbon dioxide and water. I'm breathing the carbon dioxide out, and I'm peeing the water out, or sweating it out through my body. So, this aerobic respiration allows the glucose and oxygen, I eat it, I breathe it, I turn it into energy so I can move and run around and talk, and I release carbon dioxide, water, and energy, the ability for me to move around. Now, some decomposers are underground or in the animal and they don't have enough oxygen to use it and they may use anaerobic respiration. We also refer this to as fermentation. When something ferments, it begins to go bad. This is a process where there's not enough oxygen and they're using a slightly different process. So they're not just releasing carbon dioxide and water, they're also releasing some hydrogen um, sulfides, etc. That bad smell, that rotten smell, the gas being give off. So they sometimes release methane, ethyl alcohols, so the fermentation process where we make beer or even the fruit uh, ferments in the fridge, and if you've ever got some orange juice or something's gone a little bad, it's creating some alcohol in there. Acetic acid, a sour sort of taste, well, it'll begin to get sour. That's acetic acid, a byproduct of this um, anaerobic respiration, and also some hydrogen sulfides get created. So if we don't have enough oxygen to break down the nutrients in the process, it's anaerobic and we also get some byproducts which are usually not as helpful or useful to us. Now the last thing we're going to talk about in this section is soil. Now soil is the foundation of life. I mean quite literally it's based in the soil. The plants grow from it. They need nutrients that are there and it's actually a very complex uh, system. We think soil is just dirt. Well, Mars has dirt, if you will, but it doesn't have soil. Soil is really a living thing. There's billions of bacteria, different components in a handful of soil. So it's a very complex mix. It's going to have some rock in it, particles, minerals, nutrients, etc. So just in a little thing of soil that I have here. You know, just kind of some sand and dirt and rocks, but there's organic matter, little bits of stick, plant, leaves that have begun to broke down into it. It has some air in it, bits of air compacted into it where these living organisms live. The bacteria, etc., still are using oxygen by and large for what they're doing. Now, soil formation just really begins with the weathering of bedrock. So I start off with a really huge big boulder of bedrock. Down way deep under the ground, we just run into solid rock. Well, that solid rock begins to break off into smaller chunks and smaller chunks and smaller chunks. So this just gets being broken up little bit by little bit, and that's what I find in here. Little teeny tiny, some larger rocks are in there when we dig up into the dirt, but small bits of sand and all this other matter. Now, mature soil, which is what this is, mature soil. It's fairly dark, decent soil. It's fairly mature. So if I go dig down in my yard out here, I'm going to find layers. And if you've ever dug a hole, and by a hole, I don't mean like a little thing, but like, you know, a deep hole. Maybe you use post hole diggers, put in a plant, you pull it up. Well, the first 6 to 12 inches kind of look like this. You get some nice kind of dark stuff, some plant matter in. You keep going down. Now, in Florida, we tend to start running into sand. Other places, you may start running into clay, red clay. Then you start running into more larger chunks of rock. We tend to get these layers. And the more mature the soil, the kind of deeper these layers get. 
but it depends on where you're out. They're going to differ in their texture, composition, and thickness depending on where you are. Once again, you're here in Florida, you start digging, we get into sand pretty quickly. I grew up in South Carolina, we get this nice topsoil, then you start running into clay, kind of red clay or yellowish clay, then into the rock strata more. So it depends on where you are, whether you're in a forest, in a grasslands, desert, uh, all depends. And each horizon of soil is visible in a soil profile. You know, if you kind of look at it, you can see these different little layers that we break down into. And that's what the picture up here is trying to show. On the very far end where we just see kind of rock, this is very immature soil. It's very early on or new, hasn't been exposed for very long. I'll start to get some things to grow in the top. It begins to break it up a little more. We start to get more organic matter. So it's getting to be a little more sandy looking with a tiny little layer of dark. But at the very end, it has really good mature soil. Dark brown, it goes down. There's more of the soil part, less just hard rock. And I eventually get down to deep, solid bedrock. But that takes a long time to get to. It can be thousands of years to go from immature soil to fully mature soil. And different areas are going to have different kinds. Desert, you're going to have bedrock, just kind of some clay and sand and a little tiny bit of topsoil at the top. Rainforest is also classically not very good soil. Some of our best soils are actually in forests. In forests, we get this really nice dark layer, lots of matter, and you get these nice, good, classic layers of soil, which is really what we're kind of after and look for. But the soil is paramount to life on the planet as we know it. It is a renewable resource. We use it, and we can use the nutrients up in it, and but the problem is it's renewed very slowly. You know, the leaves have to go in, they have to begin to break down and rot, be broken down by the decomposers. So soil is a renewable resource, but it takes a long time. For one inch of topsoil, about two and a half centimeters, can take hundreds to thousands of years. Now, if you're in a warm, moist environment, it might take hundreds of years. If you're in a dry or cold environment, it might take thousands. So say hundreds to thousands, I realize that's a huge margin, but it depends on the climate where you are, how long it takes to form. Even though it's a renewable resource, if we begin to deplete it faster than it can be replenished, it can be non-renewable. We can use it up to the point that it's not going to be able to use it again within our lifespan. Remember, when we talk about um, we talk about renewable versus non-renewable, we're talking about a human lifespan. So it is possible for us to deplete the soil in such a that it won't be useful for generations to come. So something we have to be careful with. The last thing I'm going to touch on is it talks about permeability. Some soil is more permeable than others. Here in Florida, we tend to have sandy soil and a lot of times the water will sink down through it. But with my kind of rock and et cetera here, we can look what I mean by it. Sand can have uh, something like, you know, 0.05 to about two millimeters in diameter. Uh, but then you get to clay where it's like 0.002 millimeters. It's really, really small. Now this is a, just a very simple demo. But when we talk about permeability, we're talking about the ability of water to flow or move through something. So with this, this will be highly permeable. I pour the water in and it just almost instantly flows down to the bottom. But here in this soil, I pour the water in and it's taking a while for it to make its way down into the soil. So it's a matter of permeability. Some soils can be so impermeable or have such a low permeability that the water tends to stay up here and run off before it can soak down into. So if I'm on a slight hill, a lot of this water is going to roll off and not make it down. The more permeable 
you know, the water comes down very quickly and gets down to the bottom. So permeability winds up being a big factor in our soil. So once again, warm, moist area, we generate mature soil much faster than somewhere that has low permeability or it's very uh, hard, dry, and packed soil. That wraps it up for section two. I uh, look forward to seeing you next time when we talk about energy that we find in these ecosystems. Take care guys and I'll see you next time.